We are really excited to connect with you guys today on another episode of State of Cybercrime focused on this Microsoft Office Zero Day. Uh, and so with that, let's uh, let's crack right into it. Before we get started, uh, again, my, my name is Matt Rodelak. I'm one of our hosts. I'm Senior Director of Incident Response and Cloud Operations at Veronis, and I'm joined by David, if you want to say hello. Hey, everybody. I'm David Gibson, SVP of Strategic Programs here at Veronis, and uh, thanks so much for joining so, um, you know, we're going to run through a lot of our usual segments today. We'll start uh, uh, seeing if there's any good news in cybersecurity. Uh, we'll jump on the, the highway to the danger zone, and we'll talk all about uh, Felina uh, and whether or not we, we, we pronounce it or spell it that way. Uh, we'll, we'll also mention some really interesting vulnerabilities that, that, that actually the Veronis team found uh, in some SaaS applications. Uh, and then we have just a couple of simple asks for you guys in order to make the things that we talk about today actionable. So um, if this is your first time attending in cybersecurity, oftentimes everything is very doom or gloom. So we always like to start our shows by talking about uh, some of the good news in the industry. Uh, and, and we do have a little bit of good news. First thing is, uh, for, for those attending from the United States today, the U.S. State Department is offering a reward of up to $10 million for information related to or leading to the arrest of members of the Conti ransomware group. So um, if you're sitting at home and you think you have a clue that might help the authorities figure out or arrest some of the people behind the Conti ransomware group, definitely head over to the State Department's website and drop them a line. Uh, you might be eligible for up to a $10 million reward. Is that, is that paid in Bitcoin? I, you know, I actually don't think it's mentioned. Maybe one of our uh, our panelists could uh, could help us find out if they're paying that out in U.S. dollars. I bet I'm going to make a hypothesis that they're paying it out in dollars and that is a taxable uh, event. So you might not actually wind up with the full 10 million, but maybe we can look into that afterwards today. In, in another bit of good news, uh, at least in, in, for, you know, in China, if you do a cyber crime, you're going to do the time. Um, one, one person who felt like their company wasn't doing what they needed to do to protect their financial databases uh, actually you know, is facing seven years of jail time because of the fact that he deleted his company's financial databases. And so you know, this really is one of the instances where we see someone doing the crime uh, and doing the time. And he was actually, I think a dog tipped him off, right? Tipped the authorities off? Yeah, I, I, I think it was something like that, David. Definitely. So, um, you know, why are we all here, right? I'm, I'm sure you guys saw the, those banner ads or from our emails where we wanted to talk about a potentially dangerous new uh, zero day vulnerability in Microsoft Office. Um, and it's called Felina. Now, before we, we talk about that, I think one of my uh, panelists has got a poll for us to launch. We're a little bit curious from you guys about uh, what you think the origination of that word is. Um, is it another name for the Jubilee? Is it a place in Italy, a type of pasta, or does it indicate the early arrival of fall? We're curious to see what you think. For those of you that are chiming in of what is Felina, Felina is actually a part um, of a postal code that was found inside of uh, some POC exploits for this vulnerability, and it represents a place in Italy. So um, thank, you know, thanks for, for chiming in with that. But what, what does it mean from a security risk perspective? Um, it's a zero day that was found in Microsoft Office, particularly a URL handler inside the Microsoft Office diagnostic tool. Uh, and what makes it so dangerous is that uh, malicious documents can, can run and remote code can be executed on your machine, um, even if you have macros blocks, even if the user doesn't actually execute or open the file. Um, and we're even going to show you a, you know, a quick uh, proof of concept or a demonstration a little bit later just about that. The other thing that's potentially risky about this is there are a lot of detections um, in place. So you know, you're not going to depend on like your end point to be able to pick up on this just yet. Uh, the other thing is, is that while there are two mitigations available, there is no official patch for this just yet as well. So we're in this limited time from when a zero day is made you know, and disclosed to the public, when we know that threat actors like Russian and Chinese state actors are exploiting it, but not necessarily the mitigations have caught up yet. And that's what makes this so potentially risky. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's interesting, you know, I think when we hear about like an office, you know, vulnerability, we associate it with macros, 
Um, this one's a little bit more scary because it allows remote execution without any macros. And in fact, it's a little bit, it, it doesn't even require an office file, right? Uh, if, we, if we look at the scope, um, it's, uh, it, it's not just the office files. Um, if you want to go to the next slide there, but I think we also have found that in addition to the office files, uh, it also applies to link files and then RTF files. And this means that you don't even need to open the file for the code to run. If you just go to the folder that contains the file in preview mode, the, 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 the script can launch. Um, and then just a little bit about how it works um, from what I understand, uh, if you go to the next slide there, I think it, it uh, basically, it seems like if you call MSDT, the Microsoft Diagnostics tool, right, by the web using the uniform resource indicator, right, the URI, then you can run remote code. Um, MSDT can be run via the command line. And if you pass it the right arguments, like skip, right, then you can also execute additional code. Uh, and then one example actually went a step further it hid that URI call in a remote HTML file that was then called by the Word document. Um, so that's with the with this this remote template functionality, right? So Word has this capability of of uh, having a remote template, right? And then they can hide the code in that. So it seems like the core issue is that in the MSDT, um, the, the URIs are not filtered, right? So you can pass an unfiltered uh, URI to the Microsoft Diagnostics tool, which can then execute arbitrary code. Uh, so, and, and I, I, you know, it, Matt, is that, am I, am I missing? No, it? I, I just want to actually reiterate one of the points that you made is that this is more of a vulnerability in that URI handler of MSDT than a Microsoft office vulnerability per se. Um, but what, what it, where, why it's so important is uh, when we think of like, uh, the average phishing attack that has like a macro enabled word document, right? We always remember where well, our users are never going to remember the macros. And I'm sure a number of our, our guests today would say, and we have macros disabled. That doesn't matter here. You could have PowerShell disabled. You could have command prompt disabled. You could have macros disabled. You could have you know, very, very locked down controls on your workstations, but this vulnerability in this, di this component of this diagnostic tool would still allow for that remote code to be executed and someone could add a user, remove a user, execute a program, download alicious files. I mean, really like the, the possibilities are endless. We, we talked about this, um, it, it does not require, actually we'll, um, uh, use the privileges of the application that calls it. So that could be system level privileges, that could be user level privileges, that could be administrator level privileges. Uh, and we actually have a little bit of a proof of concept to show you guys. So shout out to W Dorman on Twitter who put this together. Um, you'll see this is the latest uh, build of Office. We are going to visit our attacker website, uh, which is going to prompt a user to download a file. This user, is, and this is just an RTF file, so this is not necessarily like an Office document, it's a text file. They're going Going to load it in preview. They're not even going to execute the file. They're simply going to navigate to the folder inside of Windows Explorer. And then what's going to happen in the background is that's going to call out to our attacker server and receive our command, which that command is going to be to just launch calculator.exe, which is an incredibly basic proof of concept here. But this really shows you that the potential is, is limitless. It, it is potentially malicious, right? It really doesn't matter um, what you know, uh, that, that this is calculator.exe. This is just proof that the attacker can run anything that they want. They can run commands, they can run, uh, you know, drop additional files, drop malware, drop additional exploits, create additional users. Uh, it really is one of the most severe uh, zero day vulnerabilities that we've seen uh, in, 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 I would say both recent months, but maybe even in, you know, the last few years, I, I would put it right up there with things like uh, uh, log for shell and proxy shell, and uh, may, maybe even sunburst, especially if we think about, you know, how broadly uh, implica implicated it could be. Yeah, it's pretty scary, you know, just an RTF file, right? It, uh, it not even loaded. It seems like there's going to be a lot of remote code or remote execution going on.
The other thing I want to say, we've, we've seen a few people in the chat mention, um, you know, testing this exploit themselves. Um, there is a, an exploit available. If you head over to John Hammond's uh, GitHub, you, you can just follow the URL here. This is a proof of concept that would launch uh, calculator.exe on a victim's particular machine. Um, so you could test it out to see if it works in your environment. And really just, just to reiterate, right, um, where this this attacker would craft this attack to go to, to download additional content from, could be anywhere on the web. Um, and it really doesn't matter if you've got macros blocked or command prompt on your endpoints blocked. Um, these are all things that could still al allow this to make it happen. And we will share some mitigations in just a couple of minutes. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about uh, detections and kind of where to look for things, David. Yeah, so if you suspect you've got a, a host that's been hit, um, it, it's interesting. It looks like you can check the server cache registry key. Um, and it looks like this gets updated every time there's a connection, a web connection made from an office file. Um, so this is one place to start. I think it's been interesting as these things start to come out and people have access to this proof of concept and they can start to explore it. Um, we start to see people thinking up uh, signatures and, and the threat hunting queries, right? Which, you know, we can see it, um, on the next slide, you can see that um, our favorite Gossie the dog has, has come up with, with some of that here. Uh, and then of course, in addition to that, they're, they're thinking up some of the, the mitigations, right? So from an endpoint perspective, um, we see, uh, if you wanna to move to the next one there, uh, some endpoint rules and some AV signatures that have come out uh, to kind of mitigate and detect some of this behavior, but be careful, uh, as Will Dorman um, has kind of pointed out, and uh, he, he's got a tweet there on the next slide. It uh, There's so many permutations of this kind of attack. Uh, you mind going to the next slide there, Matt? Yeah, no problem. Thanks for keeping yeah. me out honest here, David. Yeah, no worries. It uh, I think, you know, some of these signatures, uh, it might be a game of whack-a-mole. Um, you know, people ask, like, can I block PowerShell? But I think we saw a proof of concept with just command, you know, batch, right? And a for loop inside that. Um, you know, it. Uh, I think I think there's so many variations of this available that it, it might be a little bit difficult to uh, to focus just on a SIG. Yeah, I, I think the really important thing, and we're going to, again, we're going to talk about mitigations in just a second. But the really important thing here is that this is a, you know, an underlying part of the operating system, this diagnostic tool and this URL handler, the URI handler that's built into it. That is the vulnerable component. And that component is across the office stack and a lot of the collaboration and like data file centric apps in the Microsoft ecosystem. So, um, or what is mitigation number one, right? You, you could actually disable the troubleshooting wizard altogether via a GPO. Now, um, th this is a this is like the I'm going to have a broader impact than just limiting this vulnerability mitigation. But it is a mitigation that is available. It is one of the ones uh, that you could take. Not necessarily our number one recommendation. We'll talk about our number one recommendation in a second. Uh, but you could disable the tool altogether uh, with a GPO. Now, what is the recommended? Oh, sorry, David. Go ahead. I was just going to say. I think they're coming out with a wizard to disable the troubleshooting wizard. Oh, well, there you go. That that is a potential patch. Just let's make a wizard for the wizard. Would we call that a wizardception? <laughs> Ooh. So uh, the, the second one, and this is the recommended way, is actually to remove that vulnerable component, which is that URI handler. And so you can do that from a command prompt as an administrator. Uh, you can just you know, go in and actually modify the registry in order to you know, carry out and change the setting and then execute the command. Or you could obviously push this out via a GPO if you're an organization that manages computers uh, with security policies. So um, this is definitely the most recommended way to do it. Uh, and if my panelists don't mind, uh, where, where we got this information from, there's a MSRC resource page. It's actually in the comments. If you could just drop that in the chat for our audience, uh, that would be really great, uh, just so that they can see and they can read all about this directly from Microsoft as well. Yeah, this, uh, this seems like the, the best way to go. So um, I want to pause before we start to talk about some of the other vulnerable vulnerabilities that are out there that the chat has lit up, that the Q&A has lit up. Um, David, let, let's take a second and, and let's go back uh, and actually answer some of those questions that have come in before we talk about those other SaaS vulnerabilities. So it uh, got a question like, you know, where does it try to download the software from? Can't we just block that? 
I, and I, I don't think there's any specific destination, right, that you can go to. Yeah, right? Well, you probably have a, a cable in your data center somewhere that goes out to the internet. And if you take an ax and you lop that cable off, you're, you're going to stop this threat, but you're probably going to also bring your business to a halt. So it really isn't possible to just block where the attacker is going to go to. Um, but if you really wanted to use the, the what we would call the nuclear option, you could disable internet access completely and you would eliminate at least an external actor from exploiting this threat. But remember, someone internally could still, you know, like an actor inside of your network could still leverage this vulnerability internally to run remote code on a particular machine. Um, so I also saw and I'll, I'll ask you these, David. Uh, what about if you have command blocked? What about if you have PowerShell blocked? Yeah, I uh, I I think um, that's probably more of a tactical nuke, right? On the but I I think it, you know blocking PowerShell for users. I think we have seen that, but you know command. I, I haven't heard of, I, I think so much would break on the OS if you tried to actually block command too. Um, I, I'm not even sure if that would if that would win you anything. What do you think about that one? Yeah. You, I would just use a different method to deliver a payload, right? If I was using command prompts to deliver payload, PowerShell deliver payload, and it was blocked as an attacker, I might use a different one. But in our proof of concept, we we simply executed calc.exe you know, remotely from, you know, the Microsoft diagnostic tool. So we spawned it from Microsoft diagnostic tool. So neither one of those would have worked there. Uh, another question came in, does it require an admin account? So wanna, wanna touch on this one, um, no. Uh, it will assume the privileges of the running application. So if we're running explorer.exe like we did in our POC, um, we would be assuming the privileges of the user. However, it really could be any process that is calling on the Microsoft diagnostic tool that then gets leveraged or exploited, which the attacker then assumes a privilege of. Most common ones that we've seen would be the system level account and the logged in user. Uh, another question, how about if you don't have a GPO, how would you manage this? Well, uh, you need to run these commands on your computers. Um, if you have a small number of computers, this probably isn't a tall order. If you have lots and lots of computers, it probably would be a little difficult to push out without a GPO, but this is what you want to do on every single one of them. Yeah. Hey, uh, I, I think we uh, we had a couple questions around like what's the impact of disabling MSMSDT and what is actually the deleting the, what is the impact of deleting that reg key with the reg key we're just aren't aren't we just changing the 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 ability to to uh, to call it via the URI handler. That, that's right. So we're, what we thought about, and we, we put our minds together for this just, just last night, actually, if you're a company that manages office templates and you update office templates remotely, you are probably going to get, you know, that capability is going to be gone um, because you're going to disable that, you know, document's ability to reach out over the web and download the latest template. That is a very small price to pay to potentially close this loophole. Versus if you get rid of the diagnostic tool altogether, then anytime, I'm sure we've all done it before, right? Uh, this program isn't working. Would you like for Microsoft to check for a problem? Um, that will be disabled altogether. Um, so there could be a broader impact of that. Yeah, so I think that second registry key there, right, basically disables the ability to call that Microsoft diagnostic tool via the web, via that URI handler. And so therefore you can't inject that command. Am I understanding that right? That, that's exactly right, right? We, we, were, we were removing the ability for that remote code to be executed by disabling the vulnerable protocol or that handler component of the Microsoft diagnostic tool. Um, I go, Sorry, go ahead. So you could still run the diagnostic tool manually, right? Like you can call it like a user user experience, like normal user experience probably wouldn't be too impacted, right? That, that Yeah, I, I don't anticipate, we haven't heard it yet. It's still very early, uh, but it, for at least the organizations that we're working with that have already implemented that mitigation, nobody seems to realize that it's even taken place versus potentially disabling the diagnostic tool, which could impact, especially when you think of, you know, uh, some of your less savvy users that might use that tool on a regular basis. Um, I, I heard another, a, a couple other people that come in, is there a patch yet? There is no patch just yet, but the, these mitigations are directly from Microsoft. So I just want to share with you guys that Microsoft has published these mitigations. They just haven't pushed out like a, a patch that would come on like either an out of patch cycle or on like a patch Tuesday, for instance, that would have like a Microsoft denotation to it. Right, and I think uh, we've got a link there. I'll paste that in uh, into the answer there as well. 
So I'll pipe that so you can see that in the Q&A. Uh, and we'll put that in the chat as well to the to that Microsoft uh, Microsoft right up there. So, yeah. And uh, another one, what, what if you're a local administrator? Do you need to save what through the registry? That's definitely the recommendation that we're walking you through right now on the screen is to either you put together a GPO to push out this registry change or to do it, at, for, you know, being a local administrator on your machine to do it on your machine directly. Um, that That's exactly what we're talking about right now. And we did have one question come in about, do you need both of these? I think that first command is actually just backing up the registry tree, right? Like that, that's right. Yeah, yeah so that's correct. Really the second second command is really the, the one we need. I think the other thing I just want to highlight, and I've seen a bunch of questions come in around this, um, you know, uh, which is like, what, what really, what are the core differences? One, you're, di you're, you're disabling like the whole thing. You're, you're, you're getting rid of the, the, the ability for the tool to function. The second one, you're just getting rid of that vulnerable component, just called that URI handler. Oh, sorry about that. Everybody skipped ahead one slide right there with my scroll wheel while I was looking through the chat. It's a cool so, app. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I just want to just want to check a couple other questions have come in. One person was just asking about uh, we want to test to make sure that it got fixed. Uh, and, a, and a person in the chat dropped in that POC to the uh, public Git repo where you can see that uh, proof of concept exploit for this. So if you put the mitigations in place and you want to test to make sure that they're effective and that particular POC, that means that calc.exe wouldn't launch. Uh, another person just asking about like, how would I know that this is successful? So um, if you deploy the fix via a GPO and you have other Microsoft solutions, like maybe a, a configuration and policy manager, you'd be able to run a query to see what all of your workstations would be on that. Uh, the other thing would be to just check on your machine against the POC code, a few different ways that you'd be able to validate this. Um, a lot of great questions. Thanks. Yeah. For yeah, thanks everybody. And we're, we're going to take time at the end to look at questions again, just because this is a really hot button topic. We did want to just double check with everybody uh, and, and check in for questions now. The other thing, and you guys might have missed this, um, is there, there are some uh, other SaaS app vulnerabilities, and you could even link them together. I, I thought a little bit about that this morning. Um, it, it has to deal with what we would call a vanity URL. So in this segment, we, we, this is vulnerable vulnerabilities. We talk about other really important things in the news that people should be concerned about. Um, and, and Veronis is Threat Labs. For those of you that aren't familiar, we'll make sure we drop a link uh, into the chat of all the research that comes out of Veronis Threat Labs. They're what look into the unknown and the never before seen types of threats and, and they even find their own zero days or other types of vulnerabilities. And so oftentimes when we sign up for things like a file sharing link or a webinar or we receive a form URL. Um, th these are things just like the one we have in the screenshot, right? apple.zoom.us slash webinar. It's this webinar registration form. Um, and what our researchers found is that you can actually change the subdomain and still direct users to the same place, which means that a lot of our security awareness training is going to be defeated by this. One of the most common things that happens in security awareness training is what? Hover over the link before you click on it. If it has the company's domain on it, it's safe. You want to click on that. But that's actually what this vulnerability takes advantage of or this risk takes advantage of. We can modify that domain. We can seemingly appear as we are a different entity. And the end user will think, I'm going to an Apple webinar right now. Uh, but all we did was to modify that subdomain because it doesn't get validated. Now, for those of you that uh, are more visual learners, we do have a video for this as well that I'm going to play for you in just a second. With so much data moving to the cloud and people working from home, phishing attacks have become very popular. Many cloud applications provide a vanity URL for enterprises to provide a distinctive experience for employees and customers. If these vanity URLs could be spoofed by an attacker, they would be a great tool in phishing campaigns, social engineering attacks, reputation attacks, and for spreading malware. I would naturally believe that a custom Veronis URL came from Veronis and is more trustworthy than a generic SaaS link, but I would be wrong to let that false sense of security lead me into sharing confidential, or personal, or business information. Here are some real-life examples of such abuses. First, this is a short demonstration we provided for Zoom. Note this is just a demonstration of the issue. We did not try to make it a viable attack. 
Let's create a new webinar in Zoom. For today's demonstration, we will choose Apple employees as our designated victims. Sorry guys, nothing personal. We need a form to lure in our victims. So, let's ask for webinar registration details and make them mandatory. We could ask for anything we want, social security numbers, passwords, credit card numbers, but if we aim to be Apple, no one will believe us with a Verona logo. So as a final touch, let's demonstrate the real security issue, the vanity URL. The subdomain was changed to Apple. Our webinar is now branded, like an Apple webinar and encrypted and signed by Zoom. There is no way to know this is not an Apple webinar. All we have to do is sit and wait for passwords to land in our mailbox. There's a similar issue in Google. Here is a document we created, branded with NASA trademarks. Again, it is not possible to tell this document did not come from NASA. Our team disclosed both of these issues to the different vendors, and they are still being fixed. So again, for, for those of you guys that might have missed that, the, the real trick there is that we changed the veronis.zoom.us URL to apple.zoom.us, and it still took us to that same page. That, that means that it's, it's not validated. It doesn't actually matter what it is. I could have changed it to, you know, you're so vain. Uh, dot u, zoom dot, dot us uh, related to David's comment earlier or really anything that I wanted to and and we're going to take advantage of you know even security aware users I, I personally think I, it would be easy for me to think this was a legitimate webinar I was signing up for now I probably wouldn't give up my password or my credit card information uh, but I might sign up for the webinar if I thought it was a legitimate uh, Veronis event for instance this is just so easy to click on. You know, if you're in a hurry, it's like you see the URL, it looks legit. I think it's going to be it's going to be hard to train users, right, to, to just don't take that for granted. Yeah. And I, and I just want to echo, we did drop a link if you guys want to read more about that. Uh, we've dropped a bunch of links in the chat. We will follow up. Uh, you guys will get an email from from our, our co-host, from our marketing host today. They'll have all the links, all the stuff that we talked about. So don't worry if you've missed it in the chat. Uh, we will stick around for a few minutes as well to make sure that you guys uh, are aware. Now, that brings us to our, our, our last segment for today. And then we are going to go back and take some more questions because we've seen a bunch start to come in, which is it's a humble ask. Uh, this is where we ask you guys to do something in order to take care of the things that we talked about today. So number one, we do recommend strongly applying uh, mitigation number two, which is actually removing and disabling uh, that URI handler component of the Microsoft diagnostic tool. Um, the second thing is this does represent a shift in when we think about like in educating our users on this vanity URL concept, we, we, we want to explain to them, we want to update our security awareness material that these vanity URLs do pose a risk. You know, we have disclosed this to the, you know, um, these vendors already and there isn't necessarily something that can be done about this because there isn't validation of those links at the subdomain level. And so um, this really is going to have to come from security awareness training in order for users to understand that they shouldn't just trust a form link or a, a document link, uh, even if it has that, that subdomain that's associated with it. Uh, and, and just to go back a couple of slides for those people that are asking while we're talking about that one, uh, we found this on box file sharing URLs on a public file request URLs, on Zoom recording and Zoom webinar registration URLs, as well as on Google Forms and Google document URLs. Uh, and our last ask, and I, I talked about this one earlier, if you do have information that could lead to or contribute to the arrest of a State Department, um, uh, or sorry, not State Department, of Conti actors, please reach out to and contact uh, the State Department. They are looking for tips and information that could lead to the identification of the location or the arrest of Conti threat actors. Um, and so with that, David, let's go back through. I know more questions have come in and more comments have come in since we've started. Um, so let's go back and, and check those out. And then uh, right at the end, we'll, we'll give you guys a really quick uh, exit poll just to, to get some of your feedback. Uh, and then we'll be able to adjourn for today. But let's cover a few, a few more of the questions that have come in. Um, what are the test cases if this URI handler is disabled? So we dropped, and I'll, I'll ask my co-host to drop another link in the chat uh, to a, a, a GitHub repo that has a POC exploit that you'd be able to test to see if the mitigation was properly implemented. Uh, we will also publish a recording of this session. Um, let's see here, what else is in here? 
I, this one is interesting. Does it affect iOS? Um, I, I'm I'm thinking that I don't I doubt that the MSDT would run on an iOS device if it were called right. So I I kind of think we're we'd be safe on that. Yeah, I think this is purely a Windows uh, Windows vulnerability. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, oh, that, great one. Um, would a, a URL filtering solution flag the link as spoofed? No. That's the really, really interesting part about this. Um, those vanity URLs would look and appear completely legitimate and take you to the legitimate website. So when we change that vanity URL from veronis.zoom.us to apple.zoom.us, we still went to a Zoom webinar registration page. We were not redirected to a malicious website. We were simply redirected to the original site with a different subdomain. Yeah, and uh, th we also got a question is, uh, does this also apply to Zoom meeting invite links? Um, I'm not sure whether that would, right, the ICS file? These, yeah, these were specifically on the webinar registrations right. and um, on the box links and the Google form and Google document URLs. All right, so a little bit of good news there. Yeah, and just, I, I would say, you know, if that video from our, our team can't help, um, the, the really important thing here is to just keep people to understand the context of that link and not just willy nilly click on everything, even if it has the company subdomain in it. And if you think about like the way that we demonstrated how someone could take advantage of that, the link is one part. That's how we trick the user into trusting us. But it was the divulging of the information and the downloading of the files that poses the real risk. So the same security concepts apply. Make sure users know not to submit their PII on a portal or their password and username um, on a portal. Make sure that they know that you know that if they, they download a file that they didn't intend on receiving, they probably shouldn't open it, especially right now with the Folino vulnerability, right? They probably shouldn't even download it or visit the website all day together yeah this one this one i think definitely it, it we need to train users to uh have their kind of antenna up whenever they click on a link that anybody sent them right it's like it's almost like it has to be in sort of a purgatory in your mind it's like i'm not trusting this yet you know Yep, and I have a couple of people asking us to go back and share the mitigations. So let me just back up through my PowerPoint deck. And again, this is that key and critical mitigation that we recommended on removing that uh, MSDT URI handler. One question, Matt, is the registry key different um, than disabling the troubleshooting wizard in group policy? So yeah, both would it would carry out the 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 uh, intended result, which is mitigating the vulnerability. One is just more broad than the second one, right? You can disable the whole thing, or you could just disable the vulnerable protocol. I will put it up on the screen one more time. Uh, where we had that uh, GitHub repository of the POC exploit. If you wanted to test it out yourself to make sure that those mitigations were effective. Uh, and I think I think with that, uh, David, uh, maybe we can uh, send our audience off for the day and look forward to our next episode. Yeah, definitely go uh, go hunt some registry keys. So uh, you know, thank you everybody. We we, uh, we these shows are made possible by you, our audience. We really appreciate all the feedback that you gave us in the chat, uh, your participation in both the chat and the Q and A, uh, and we look forward to chatting with you guys next time on our next episode of the State of Cybercrime. Thanks so much.